Well, we have a packed evening in terms of presentation, so I don't want to take up further time. I do want to thank you, and I want to turn the microphone over to Council Member Joyce Strauss. We didn't practice this tonight, so we look like we're dancing up here, it might be true. I'm, I'm Joyce Terosiak, I'm the District 4 Council Member, and you're sitting in District 4, so I want to welcome you here. You probably live here too, half, half of you probably live in District 4, does anyone know if they live in District 4, raise your hand. Excellent, so if you live in District 3, raise your hand. Great, okay, well we have good representation here, Council Member Sousa is your Council Member from District 3. She will be giving the closing remarks tonight, so I get to start off the show, sort of the warm-up band. I just, I just want to thank you all for coming tonight to hear what's going on in Districts 3 and 4. We sort of combine the districts because there's a lot of commonalities and we're doing a lot of things sort of together. Certainly the uh, Washington Manor Homeowners Association, the largest homeowners association in San Leandro, covers both districts three and four, and we have a couple of uh, board members from the Washington Manor Homeowners Association. Vice President Bob Lee is here from Washington HOA, and we have Julie Vieira, who's the membership chair from Washington Manor Homeowners Association. You can give her your $10 tonight and renew your membership to the Homeowners Association. They do a lot of work for us. You don't have to be a homeowner. You don't have to be a homeowner want to participate. And the Homeowners Association meets on the second Wednesday of the month. So that's going to be in two, two Wednesdays for this month. So, and they meet at seven o'clock at the Fargo Senior Center Building C. It's a little tricky to find if you've never been to the Fargo Senior Center on Fargo Avenue. But once you find it, you'll, you'll, you'll remember it forever. So I encourage you to come to the meetings. They're always informative. Our last meeting this month was about the turnouts that are going to be built at Corvallis and Washington Manor Middle Schools over the next two years. So you're going to see some construction going on at Washington Manor Middle School. You might have seen the fences already put up in front of Washington Manor Middle School. That's because they're going to be building a turnout for the parents picking up their children. And that's going to be under construction this summer hopefully completed by school this fall. So you can see a lot of work happening over the next couple months in front of Washington Manor Middle School. And then they'll do an equivalent type of project at Corvallis either next year or the following year. So you'll see that type of construction too. The other item that's going on in District 4, that you may not realize that this is District 4, but we're going to be having a dog park built in District 4. You may not realize that District 4 includes parts of the marina. So if you've ever been down to the Bay Trail, right along the flood control channel, at the very end of Neptune Drive, we're going to be building a dog park, and it's going to go next to the building that has the whale mural on it. And that's going to be built starting, Ken, is that uh, September, it's August? About, I mean, about a month, I'll actually start seeing uh, construction there. In about a month, we'll start seeing construction on the dog park in August. So that's going to be built hopefully by the fall while it's still sunny out and you can still take your dogs down there and, and run them free in a fenced-in dog area for all of our residents. Other than that, there's not too much going on in District 4 because the big project in San Leandro is going on in District 3, and that's the Kaiser Hospital that's being built. I think all of you can see it from your house now. It's pretty tall. It's going to be just an enormous benefit to the city of San Leandro, and I think they've done a really good job trying to minimize impacts to the residents. We're actually going to a topping off ceremony. That's where you put the final steel beam on the very top of the tallest building, and that's going to take place next week. But the actual construction is not going to be done for another two or almost three more years. So it's a very long process to build a hospital the regulations through the state are extensive, and so they have to do a lot of burning in of the building, I guess you would call it, before they can actually turn it into a hospital. So it will take a long time, but we're already starting to see some of the benefits of all that activity down there. So with that, I would like to now turn it over to Council Member Souza, or, or am I introducing the chief? See, I told you this was not rehearsed. So I'd like to uh, take, the, take a moment to introduce you to our new chief of police in San Leandro. 
Chief Sandra Spagnoli came to us from the city of Benicia, where she was chief for four years. But prior to that, she actually served the residents of San Carlos, is that correct? San Carlos as a police officer and lieutenant for 16 years. So she has a lot of years of service uh, from a law enforcement standpoint. We're very, very fortunate to have Chief Spagnoli come to San Leandro and to work with our officers and make, she's really uh, doing a lot of new things she'll talk to you about in terms of making our department very responsive, very efficient, and most of all, very effective for the residents here in San Leandro. So I'd like you all to welcome our new chief, Sandra Spagnoli. Try to talk without this. Um, I'm good. Okay. So, uh, well, good evening. And um, anytime I have a chance to talk about what's going on in town, what's your or just the yeah, one light on. Um, anytime I have a chance to get a talk about the police department or crime and things that are happening in your neighborhood, it's certainly a great opportunity for me. So um, I encourage you to ask questions. We have a, a few minutes. We're going to start with some of the community outreach programs and crime prevention programs um, because those are really what keeps this community going. Um, solving crime is really a partnership. Uh, we can't do it by ourselves. Really, at any given time, we have somewhere between about 8 and maybe 15 officers for a community of 85,000. Uh, so when you think about it, we need the eyes and ears of the community to help us solve crime. Uh, just actually earlier today, we had a uh, in-progress residential burglary um, within the b and &E area. That's up, yeah, right around the police department. Sure. And what happened is, is uh, one of the neighbors called. They said they saw a guy suspicious coming from their neighbor's house. It wasn't their neighbor. We arrived there, and lo and behold, um, he jumps in the backyard after he had burglarized the home. Um, and he started to undress to pretend that he was jogging in the community. And said, you know, what is it that you need, officers? I'm just taking a jog in my underwear and T-shirt. <laughs> And the smart officer said, we need to talk to you. <laughs> so he's in custody for residential burglary. And really, um, it was in part by the police department who set up a perimeter to catch him. But the second piece, um, and really the pri primary, primary reason that we were even out there is because the community members called us, and they're really the eyes and ears of taking that suspect into custody. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the programs that we have to offer. Um, the first program that we have to offer, and can we make the, this front dark? Where's Kathy? Okay. So um, if you can hear me. So probably one of the, the first things that we do, and really residents and businesses, a lot of them don't take advantage of this free service. We're really lucky in this community to be able to continue to offer um, security inspections. We call by uh, environmental design, where you have um, a police officer or two, which is Kerry Kovich or uh, Tim DeGrano, who will actually come to your home and business and do a security assessment for you. And we look at areas like your bushes. If your bushes are too high and they cover the front, uh, front door or your front window, we'll talk about cutting those down. And we'll give you security ideas for your specific home or your specific business that will make you less a target for crime. Um, the second thing we do is we do neighborhood watch programs. How many people in here are involved in neighborhood watch? Anyone? Great. So maybe half the residents here are involved in neighborhood watch. Really, next time we come out here, we would really like everyone to have some participation in neighborhood watch. And we're going to talk about going down National Night Out, which is August 2nd. Um, and invite members of the community to participate in National Night Out, which really started about 50 years ago when um, it was really to fight uh, neighborhoods that got together to fight back on crime. And what National Night Out is, is um, the police department, the fire department, other cities' departments work together. We come out um, in preset designations. Uh, communities just come out and get together, um, and it is amazing to see this. We have how many neighbor? It's like 50? Neighborhoods? 56 groups. We have 56 uh, national night out areas in town. So there's probably a national night area in your area and would encourage you to participate. 
Um, it's really part of crime prevention and neighbors getting to know their neighbors. Uh, going back up, we have um, a uh, crime-free business program. It's been very effective uh, to identify those areas in a business that we can help them correct to reduce crime, reduce or prevent crime. We have uh, crime-free multi-housing, which Carrie Kovach, who's a police officer in our community, runs. Who's aware of what crime-free multi-housing is? Is anyone in here? Okay, so a few people are. This has been a very effective program. We have about 80% of our multi-housing units are participating in this program. And what this program does is we work with the managers and the property owners of the large-scale properties who have multi-family, uh, multi-unit <coughs> housing units. And uh, we work with them um, to prevent and deter crime. We work on the areas that really cause crime especially when we have people that come in, have large parties, are doing drug dealing. Um, and this is a program that really helps prevent that. And if it is happening, um, it helps resolve those problems. Um, crime mapping is something new we have to offer. And what crime mapping is, is you go to this report. And for those of you who haven't grabbed one, if you all didn't get one, we'll be sure to provide you with one, is grab one of these handouts. It has um, all the information of our website and our contact information. But crime mapping is a pretty neat tool. So you go to this website, crimereports.com, enter San Leandro, you can draw down on your area, and we've chosen several different crimes for you to map in your area. And so the crimes that people really want to know about. You want to know about what's happening with burglaries and thefts um, and those type of assaults. So you can draw down on your area and see what's happening in um, your area. And then you can also take a look at how does that compare citywide. We think that the more information residents have about crime, um, the more you can help us prevent crime from happening. What if you don't have a computer? Yeah, this is all computer literacy. Sure. And I have tried to report and do business not only with the city of San Leandro, but the group of us who are doing this on a statewide basis. And everything that we're running into is being torn down by the misuse of the computer by the people who are using the computer, supposedly because we're in a situation now where we don't have enough funding coming in to hire as many people as we need to hire within the local level of government. And unless we start doing that, pretty soon, you're not going to have anybody in these audiences except, except a bunch of old fogies over here that know one another and come to all these places. All, all right. the time so, see the same thing over and over I think again. that's what your question is, is what if you don't have access to this information that's only available? No, what if your computer illiterate? You've right. got the access on the computer. If you can't, if, if your computer illiterate, I can't participate. Right. So I think um, I think that's a really good question. One of the things I'm going to talk about um, shortly is um, a program that we're starting um, with the police officers to go out in your community and actually address issues in your exact area. And when you talk about things that um, you can't have access to the computer, you need us to help you with that. Um, we would actually come and train. Um, small neighborhood groups on how to use and navigate through the systems because the links are available in our on our website. Now, if you, if you really can't even get to the website, one of the things that we can encourage through neighborhood groups is that someone within that neighborhood be able to print those documents and work with our neighborhood officers um, to get that information to you actually in paper yeah. so that you don't have to have get it from our website because we do know that not everyone has access to the computer. So that was a good question. Um, um, two programs that we just started within the last year are the Citizens Police Academy and the Teen Police Academy, where we encourage residents to um, participate, get to know about the department, <coughs> get to know about the resources we have available. Um, it's a program that we've got a lot of positive responses on, and if you are interested, you can call one of the numbers on the back of the page or even check it out on our website. The one thing that we're starting in the fall is coffee with the cops, and we're bringing the officers that are in your neighborhood officers to your neighborhood meetings, whether it's at um, a local business or into your neighborhood homeowners associations, where we can meet together with you and talk about what's going on in your neighborhood. Um, a lot of things, um, when we get, right now, we have uh, residents from the 7, 3, 4, and 6. That's a lot of area to cover. So by bringing the officers that work in your area to the homeowners associations, to um, the local um, 
coffee places, we can meet with you and talk about the areas in your specific area. And we think that that will um, be able to get information about what we have available and what you can do in your area to uh, reduce crime. The other thing that we have for those people that have computers is online reporting now available. And you can go online to report some of the minor crimes that are happening in the neighborhood. And maybe um, an officer wouldn't need to come out there. Um, at our department, we will still come out if you don't have a computer, if you want to talk to a police officer, we'll actually will come out to you. So it's not in a replacement for an officer. It's just that if you want the um, access to just go online and report it yourself, uh, many reports are for insurance purposes, but they do help our statistics as well, so we know what's going on in the neighborhood. So that is a new feature we have on our website. Um, a couple other things that we have on our website I think that's worth talking about is um, we are moving towards moving our police act, um, activity <laughs> logs. So sometimes in like the San Leandro Times or some of the online things, you'll read what's happening in town. We'll have a link to uh, the majority of the calls for service. You can have direct access. So if you see that um, the police officers are down here at El Torito and you want to know what's going on, you can actually go on the website within a couple hours and kind of get an idea of what was happening. Sometimes we get inundated from people want to know what's going on. And it's really hard for a dispatch center um, to be able to answer 85,000 people answer on what's going on in this area. So we thought this is a user-friendly way for those who have computer access to find what's going on. And the arrest log, by law, we have to provide it anyway. So it gives a log of all the people that we arrest on a daily basis. The last thing that's important if you have children or grandchildren or live by a school is the Megan's Law link. The Megan's Law link will provide you information on sex offenders registered in your area. And this is really important. So if you belong to a PTA or you're a grandparent and you want to know what sex offenders are registered in your area or an area that you frequent, you can go ahead and uh, go online and see a map of it. The other thing that's important about Megan's Law, also if you have a name you want to enter and review and see if they're a sex offender, you can do that well. Um, it's a read only, so you can't enter somebody's name. Uh, <laughs> that's a good thing. But, um, the nice feature of this is, um, as residents, we want you to be aware of the predators that are living in the community, and that um, uh, most of them have photos and also shows the offense that they violated. So I think it's important to be um, informed about those. The next thing I'm going to go over, um, and it's really just talking about crime statistics and what's happening in town. And this is the whole town. Last year we had an amazing year for crime. It wasn't all, all just in San Leandro that had an amazing year. All throughout uh, the United States, crime was down. It's sort of an odd thing, you know. Um, even people that study crime all the time can't figure out why in one of the worst economies is crime really down. Um, we feel that um, it was an anomaly of a year in law enforcement. We feel like with the changes in the state budget, you're going to see prison release and parole reform. Those areas are going to have a heavy impact, especially in the Bay Area and the city of San Leandro. Um, so we, we feel that we're really going to have to work on those issues to combat crime because we know that um, the criminals are being released and there's going to be little supervision. So um, we feel that last year was a great year because we have a proactive police department and we're going to have to do harder this year to keep crime down. So year to date, where are we at, at cr with crime? Well, where we're at is we're up 6% compared to last year. So we compare our crime stats. When we look at crime rate, we really look at these 10 crimes. There are assaults, robberies, rapes, um, burglary, larceny. Um, and arsons, and we look at those because we compare every city in the United States reports those crimes. You couldn't possibly report every crime that happens. So those are the areas that we compare ourselves to other cities, like cities. So this year, although crime is up 6% this year, um, that doesn't surprise me because remember, last year, crime was down at a 30-year low, which is amazing. So it wouldn't be unusual for the next year to kind of creep up to normal. We look at crime really over a five-year period of time or a 10-year period of time to look at trends. So when you have an almost even line and you have a dip, um, that is not unusual to see. Um, so the, the rise in crime this year a little bit um, does not have us overly concerned, um, but we're working on strategies, so hopefully we can have another good year as last year. So looking at crime statistics overall, so this is how, as a chief, this is how I would look over crime and see how we're doing. 
Um, and as you can see, this year, which is 2011 at the end, year to date, <coughs> really, um, when I look at over in the past, we're doing pretty good year to date. Um, so we're still having a low year, but we often compare it to the year before. Um, I don't like doing that necessarily, so that's why I like looking at, at a, over a five-year period. So over a five-year period in the whole city, um, crime is still down, um, especially since uh, 2008. You can see where we had definitely a spike in crime. And um, next I'm going to introduce Officer Tim DeGrana, who's really going to talk about um, some of the crime trends that we're seeing. Um, for us, uh, since we're uh, representing council districts here tonight, um, the areas that he's going to be talking about specifically cover four beats in our cities, because our beats aren't actually cut down into council districts. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Tim to talk about that. Good evening. Good evening. So, like the Chief said, Districts 3 and 4, and this is the district map with your council members for each district. It's set up differently for the police department. So in those two districts, you have four beats. Seven, which is the downtown area and just north of uh, the, the police department, goes as far to the east side of 880. You have beat three, which is the center of town. It borders every beat except for beat one, which is the north end of town. Beat six, which is down here in the manor, and beat four, which is for the most part, the industrial area and the marina. So there's four different beats within those two districts. If you look here for, this is the averages for all council districts. So robbery, we had 14. And that's from January 1 to May 31st. Okay, so the end of May, from January to the end of May um, last month, we had 14 robberies throughout. 10 of those were in district three. Three of those we're in District 4. Again, that's multiple beats, not just the district alone. And so you can read down, and the assaults are the same. Larceny is your, is your theft, your petty theft. A lot of those have to do because you have Marina Square on beat 3. So you have all those stores, a lot of shoplifters. It's the same thing if you lived on this end over here and you have Bayfair. That, that's going to up the ante a little bit. That's going to put the numbers up there. Auto theft, the average for all council districts was 43. The average in District 3 is 50. Of course, that's a couple different beats. In District 4, you have 14. Okay. So what happens is we look at those, and again, like the Chief said, it's a little difficult to look just in that time frame to see if there is a trend. So what I like to say is that when the economy was starting to go down a few years back, and folks, it was very easy to say that, well, of course crime is going to go up. Now these folks are out there ripping us off and doing this, that, and the other thing. I am here to tell you, after doing this job for more than 20 years, the people that are committing the crimes, as you see here, are the same folks that would be committing the crimes if the town was flush, if we had money running out of our pockets. It doesn't matter. That's what they do. So the job for us is to find out how do we stop that, what trends do we look for, and they're easy things, actually. Community involvement is one of them. So we try and do a better job of going out to you, meetings like this, neighborhood watch meetings. The newest thing coming in the fall will be us actually sitting down with you. It could be four of you. It could be 20 of you. It just depends on the location if they can accommodate that many of us. So you're going to sit down with that beat officer and you're going to say, hey, listen, here's the deal. We've lived here for 30 years. How many people have lived here for more than 30 years? Quite a few. I knew that was going to be the answer. I knew that was going to be the answer. I live here in town. I've been here for a little over 18 years now. So I have a stake in it as well, but I'm a police officer. So really, I live here the whole time that I'm working here. But they're your neighborhoods. So it's better for us to go and sit down with you, and you tell us what maybe you weren't able to put in an email, because you either don't have a computer, or you're not real adept at using the computer that way, or that's just not the way you function, and that's fine. Okay? I fight technology all the time, but it's here, and i got to learn to use it. So it's easy enough for me to go and talk to you one-on-one. -on -one. We have some folks here for Citizens for a Safer San Leandro, a great group. We work closely with them. They get a lot of information out for us. So if I can start doing that, and my partner can start doing that, and the beat officer that works in your area can come out and talk to you about things like this and how we can solve them, or how we can try and put a stop to them, that's going to be much better. Because maybe there's problems that you had, or concerns that you had that we don't know about. And we would love to hear them. So that's one of the programs that's coming up. So. If you look at stolen vehicles for the same amount of time, we look at it and say, okay, 
We know that most of those vehicles were taken during the daytime hours. They may not have been reported during that time. But when you get home from work and find out that the extra car that you're lucky enough to have was taken, you know that it was there at 10 o'clock in the morning or it was there at 7 when you left and you came home at 6 or 7 at night and now it's gone. Well, now we have the time frame. So we know it was taken during the day. Not when it was reported, but when it was taken. Same thing with the robberies. We had 10 of them. Three of them occurred at Marina Square Shopping Center. That place gets packed. Okay, So you get a lot of people walking around. Some of these programs that we, we will teach you, we will show you, offer you tools so that you can go shopping, be more alert, not digging in your purse, walking to the car, looking for your car keys with your head down. If I'm a crook, that spells to me that you're a target. And why wouldn't I go after the easy target? Simple. That's crook, crook 101. That's what they do. Burglaries, 39 of them. Okay? They occurred evenly between the day and the nighttime hours. Those of you that have been to any meetings or any trainings or anything like that with where, where I've been there and I've explained this to you, or have not explained it to you because it's very difficult, S sometimes there's no rhyme or reason as to why, except that a lot more of us are working shift work or working from our homes and do something else outside of the normal work hours. Crooks notice these things. They notice patterns. If your car is parked in the driveway for any more than a couple of days and that crook has been down the block, any more than a couple of days, and that car has not moved, they know you may not be home. And they're going to go target that house. So that's a trend. Auto burglary, there's 42. It's a high concentration of burglaries in the Bay Fair Marina Square Shopping Center. Why? What's a simple answer? Can anybody tell me? Lots of cars. Absolutely. That's a target-rich environment. So what do our officers do? During the time that they have, and sometimes they don't have a whole lot of time because they're going from call to call to call, they spend it in these parking lots. They may park in a location where you're not normally going to see that patrol car and walk through there, hoping, hey, we want to catch the bad guys. That's what we do. That's what we signed up for. So we're walking in the hopes that we may see one happening. That's a good day for us. That's a great day for us. So that's what we're trying to do. So this is for District 4. Okay, that was just, well, yeah, 4 because... It's the same thing, you see the theme here. Uh, you got Greenhouse Shopping Center, a lot of cars, a lot of stores. So you're gonna have that half occurred in the Greenhouse Shopping Center, South of the The robberies, two occurred during the daytime hours, okay? That's people, that what's that? Any of that car is that included in that? That is not included in that. Uh, robberies are, are separate from the carjacking. Okay. We don't list them under that, okay? Uh, burglary, same thing. 12 occurred in the Washington Manor area. 10 during the nighttime hours, 7 in the Marina Vista area with 6 occurring at night. So most of those were in, the night, in nighttime. I can tell you right now that out of these burglaries that are down in the manor, we did have a rash down here. We did catch three individuals that were responsible for five of those burglaries. Five of them. Okay? So that's what happens. And I believe it was an alert neighbor that gave us a tip that led us to a license plate that led us to catching those people. So. That stuff works. So going back to the question just about carjackings, we, those are few and far between in this community. But when you talk about crime prevention, it just doesn't stop when you leave your house or when you leave your business. It's when you're driving too. When you're not paying attention when you're driving, that's what they're looking for. So pay attention when you're driving too. You know, the cars, um, most, most newer cars, the doors lock um, when you're driving. Um, or if you want to lock your car when you're driving, you know, that would help as well. But be proactive and look um, and be aware of your surroundings because, again, they're looking for people that aren't paying attention. Absolutely. So there it is, big and bold. Everybody that's, that's ever been to one of these, you know you can call, you can leave an email for me, you can send it through the snail mail, through the U.S. Postal Service. Three days later, five days later, I'll get it and I'll answer you. I still get mail. I get actual mail where you can actually rip it open and read it, and I kind of enjoy that because you don't see it all the time. But emails, absolutely, and uh, telephone calls. Uh, if you may get my voicemail. Uh, we're pretty busy upstairs, but I'll get back to you. So one of the things we're going to talk about is um, the trucks on Manor. Yes. Uh, there was some question about what's being done about the big rigs, when we say trucks, the big rigs on Manor Boulevard. Okay. We have, what's that? Somebody had a question? I, I, I was curious too because we walk the dogs in the evening, you see these big 
I mean, massive trucks. And, and the road wasn't built for that. Never so built. I'm thinking, what's going on with, you know, the infrastructure underneath, with the sewers and the water and everything else that's going on underneath? The things that we experience down here, you have to imagine, uh, and it's your community, that they experience it up on the north end as well and out on the west end, the same thing. So what we have to do is we have to target it. We have to do targeted enforcement on that because we can't be obviously be everywhere all the time. Um, and people do call and say, hey, listen, there's a big rig, you know, flying down Manor Boulevard. You've got a bunch of stop signs, and so it's wadding up traffic. People can't get out of their driveways, and it's going to ruin the road. We have an officer who does commercial enforcement, trained to do commercial enforcement. Finds everything wrong with big rigs, knows all the routes that they're supposed to use and not supposed to use. It is in the works now, and that's Officer Jeff Bouliers from our traffic division. He will be doing the targeted enforcement for Manor Boulevard, as well as uh, Merced Marina, I think. Uh, yeah, I think Everything that ends up down here, he's going to be, he's going to be targeting it. And one um, of the things we do proactively with the businesses, because these people are driving usually to go to businesses to pick up and drop off. and. Actually, Jeff, what he's doing is meeting and working with businesses. He does anywhere between one and four hour presentations with actually the drivers themselves and the business owners to educate them of um, if you are doing this, um, you will get a citation and we are doing enforcement. So um, we have really the luxury to continue to do this in our community, especially because we have a large industrial area. and We feel that doing target enforcement is going to reduce the violations. Because uh, you're right, it ruins our streets. The streets aren't equipped and prepared to handle that amount of weight, um, and that's why they're not supposed to be going on those roads. Do you bring up to the businesses that uh, you know, a lot of trucks come from out of state? Correct. They're unfamiliar with whatever. They look at their GPS and says, boom, 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 boom. It's on a truck down. Boom, 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 boom. And that's where you go and it's down. So um, we have what is designed, and we work with the city engineer's office to design, design truck routes that go specifically in and out to large business areas and in our industrial park. And so, um, and the drivers clearly know no matter what state they're in, there are truck routes for them to drive, which are um, adequately marked as well. And so um, obviously if something wasn't adequately marked, we wouldn't cite for that. But um, one of the things about doing commercial enforcement is to make sure not only our truck routes are, are marked well, but also that um, we have the aggressive enforcement on it because of the problems that it's creating. And we know that 10 out of 10 times, they know it wasn't a truck route, and they knew that there was a quick way to go through a residential area. So. All the crime committed in San Diego, are they done by San Diego? Other towns coming into our town. For the most part, and the last time we did, a, not a study, but to get the statistics for that, and it was over a five-year period, we determined that most of them, no, they do not. They do not live in town, but they come in and commit a crime here in town. We do have our own crooks, homegrown, right here. <laughs> Trust me. But the, the, uh, the, the percentage is higher for people that do not live in our town. Yeah, one of the suggestions I always make is that people should not be reluctant to call something in that is unusual. It may fit with some other activities and be very valuable to the officer that's investigating it. But don't be afraid to call stuff in. And we would encourage that there's a non-emergency number um, to call. Now, uh, we have transitioned to an automated attendant who answers the police department phones. And it has created some frustration. But um, the reason why we had to do um, and switch over to an automated attendant is that we get, um, we used to get about 65,000 calls a year into our dispatch center. There's two to three dispatchers handling 65,000 calls a year. We just moved and transitioned. We were one of the last agencies in the state to transition to E911. So when you're on your cell phone, you dial 911, it'll go directly into our dispatch center, not CHP, which is a great feature, right? When you have an emergency, dial 911, your hometown dispatcher is answering. Well, what that created is almost uh, about 18,000 additional calls in our dispatch center. When you add 18,000 more calls coming in the dispatch center and you add no more people, um, and they're answering every single call that comes into the police department. Um, I, I, I know from experience, I know as a resident, you don't want somebody giving directions on how to get to Marina Square when you have an emergency. And so we've created the phone tree for non-emergency calls so that you can go to the right place in the police department. Um, it's gonna take some getting used to. We're refining the system, but what that has done is it keeps the dispatchers available for those emergency in-progress calls. 
And so um, just be patient with the system. Once you call it a couple times, you'll get used to the numbers. Now that's just with landlines? Uh, no, actually with your Sorry. phone. If you dial 911 um, on your cell phone and you're not close to a freeway, um, it'll go directly into our dispatch center. If you're close or on or close to the freeway, it could bounce off um, the towers on the freeway and go into CHP. One of the things, um, and especially when I went to one homeowner's group, um, they were going to um, program 911 or take the non-emergency line off their phone. Um, and sometimes when you're dialing 911 from a cell phone, it gives us GPS coordinates. So it doesn't say you're at the Marina Community Center. So it's problematic if you're having a medical condition, you can't tell us where it's at, we'll plug in those numbers, and there's some margin of error. It's pretty accurate, but it doesn't tell us you're sitting here in this room. So I would also, if you are home and having a medical emergency and you get to your hard line, call your hard line, because we'll know where exactly where you are. Uh, they haven't refined the 911 system so well that it knows where you are on a cell phone. It just tells us the GPS coordinates. We have to map it to get there. Do you know how many Teamsters members that used to live in the city of San Leandro that carried a union card as a Teamster? They in the city of San Leandro. Yeah, you got me there. Teamsters? Uh, there used to be 130. Okay. And now there's none. All right, we have a question in the back. Jim, did well, you have a question? I was going to finish my question. I, I mean, I'd like, I'd like to get, find out that you understand this. You've got another question in the back. This is very important. Okay, so I understand that you have a question about Teamsters. That's a really good question. However, um, I, know, I don't know. I know, how however it is, but you're doing this all the time, and you continually do it to me. So maybe these people in this audience don't know, but I want to let you know it. The mayor over there knows it. Now, the question is, very simple, in the city of San Leandro, there were 135 teams of drivers that turned to work every day. Today, they don't have a single one. Now, I'll ask you the question, why don't they have a single Teamster Union driver working? Does anybody in the audience know why? All right, so like that... No, because they don't have any union All right, contracts in the anymore. Back. Okay. I'd like to know why it's relevant, because really we need to know Actually, that's, that's, that's that's our time. get into why it's any other... Let's, this part of the presentation is related to crime and public safety. Um, let's Look, keep the questions within that topic. Safety. So any yes. other questions? Well, I'd like to say on behalf of the residents of Mission Bay that we'd like your direct service that we get quick responses from our call. Our population is aging and we have over 600 residents all above, should be above 55 or, you know, and we have people like my neighbor is 94, we have another lady that's 98 living there and we really appreciate San Leandro Police Department giving us such quick responses to our calls and uh, we, we program the direct lines. So thank you for that comment. You know, um, there are statewide averages that we try to meet for our non-emergency and our emergency responses and we're starting to track and make sure that we continue to stay um, within those averages or actually go below those averages to respond to not only your 911 call within uh, two to three rings, to get to your emergency within two to four minutes, and to get to your non-emergency under 10 minutes. And when we have and look at our performance measures, you know, we continually um, try to beat our measures, our performance response time. So thank you for that feedback. Uh, question? Hi, uh, the would be 4th of July upon us. Uh, do you want neighbors calling you guys about the fireworks? Or is that something just... <laughs> well, we prefer you actually call the fire department. Yeah. Uh, we have the chief here. <laughs> <laughs> call as many times as you want. <laughs> Here's what happens on, on 4th of July. We obviously, you're going to get our dispatch center, they get inundated. They get inundated with shots fired calls. That's what it comes out as, a shots fired. Well, it's 4th of July, New Year's Eve is exactly the same thing. Um, and so they come in that way. Well, we know that they're probably fireworks, but we still respond to that area. Now, if the officer has been out to the area before, but now it's a different caller, and he knows or she knows that is absolutely it's a firework of some sort, he will cancel out the other units or she will cancel out the other units and they will respond there just to make sure they're not out on the street. But we will actively search out for any of the illegal fireworks and all of them are illegal in the city of San Leandro. And the reason for that is obvious. 
we don't want any roofs going up ablaze, which starts the next house down, because that's horrible and there's nothing worse than that. So we will be out there actively enforcing those that have possession of, are using, or are selling, because believe it or not, Good. we get those. So please do call if you only hear it once. You know, but if you hear ongoing, please give us a call so we can go out there. We have saturated enforcement. We have um, multiple extra um, units out actually looking at it. And then obviously we still have, especially some of the areas that create a problem, we have more units out in that area. And actually we're working in partnership with the fire department too, who has a proactive prevention um, or intervention program. Did you want to give a plug to fire prevention? Well, I was actually just here to observe. But <laughs> I guess I've been exposed. But, uh, yes, we're going to be working in coordination with San Leandro PD, and we have a communications plan so we can talk directly to them, directly to the comm center. And we do want to hear about any sort of complaints where we feel there's a fire hazard. And a PD officer, the engines will be out on the street, we'll be going at dusk, and there'll be multiple chief officers and extra engines on the street. So we want to make sure we're very visible and the response times are down so we can do no fireworks are legal in San Diego here. No safety saying there's no fireworks. All right, any other? Thank you, Chief. I just wanted to see if you could touch on if people see fireworks coming from the backyard, but they can't see who's doing it, they, someone in the house can still be arrested, correct? Isn't that our. It depends what they're doing. We would probably take it and give them it's a citation. So, yes. It so, is. you don't have to see them. You just have to know it came from that house. Right, but usually you have to issue a citation to one person. Usually what we end up doing in those situations, we'll go out and we'll seize the fireworks, and um, if we could tell who was using it, we might issue a citation. Yeah. Okay, do you question over here? You too. <laughs> question. Yes, sir. Why do you allow people to go door to door selling strawberries, selling strawberries in the street corners? Yeah, yeah. ice cream carts. Mm -hmm. And they're driving ice cream trucks when we only have four trucks that think they're illegal. So we have um, solicitor's permit. If you see somebody soliciting in town without a permit, please give us a call. Um, soliciting in town without a permit is a problem, and we do do enforcement on it. So if you have those um, issues in your area and you see it going on, give us a call and we'll come out. We'll check if they have um, a solicitor's permit, and uh, we do issue those. I don't know how many we issue, but we do issue a lot of those. I do have a comment on that. I did see an officer stop and uh, talk to a man that was on the corner of Floresta and Monterey and the guy packed up and took off and I opened the window and yelled thank you officer <laughs> so you know that just ruins businesses that pay the business license and pay their taxes right and the other thing about um, solicitors the magazine solicitors mm -hmm. whoever you know um, you know the exception is the Girl Scouts right they come out and solicit but um, the magazine solicitors you know a lot of them for out of state um, sometimes they're crooks and what they do is they work under the kind of auspice that they are soliciting so they knock on your door and when you don't answer they either let themselves in or they go around the back and let themselves in and then if they're stopped by the cops they say I'm just soliciting you know I'm not doing anything wrong mm -hmm. so um, it's really important that you call on any solicitors so we can do the enforcement and see if they're a legitimate solicitor so, any other questions? Yeah. A comment. Uh, this information here is really great. And I would love if the police could do maybe a column every couple of weeks in the Italian Times with a little bit of the information information that you have covered here. Like before the 4th of July about where who you talk to or you know, whatever it is. So we actually, we, we actually do actively do that. Um, we did a press release um, in conjunction with the fire department um, in the county um, to talk about just this. So it is important. We use the social media. We use the newspapers just to put out that information. So thank you. Yeah, I read all the stuff. My wife's avid reads the Santa Ana Times every Thursday. The stuff that's in there. Yeah, read website. the website because it will have more information when we get this stuff on do you, it. Yeah. Do, you, do you also post when you catch them? Um, I've never seen that in the paper. So uh, the paper is um, their own business. And so what we do is we do press releases. And I think what happens is they'll put the press releases that we caught somebody, but they won't tie it into what article is written. Yeah. And that's really an editor's um, yeah. issue. Uh, we put out when we make major arrests, when we arrest for burglars, we arrest robbers. Um, we put that out in a press release. We put the names out there. We put what crime it was. Um, I would maybe talk to the editor of the paper if they're not connecting it to 
what crime it was in the log. But with a feature that you're going to like on the website is you're going to be able to see the crimes and you're going to be able to see the dispositions when we catch people. And then you can go to the press releases and see what happened as a follow-up um, right. to those incidents. Yeah. So you are catching yeah, yeah, and um, you know we arrest about um, anywhere between 10 to 15 people a day, um, which is a lot. We house almost 20 people in our jail on average uh, per day, and so um, that's that's pretty busy. You're pretty proactive. You're arresting. We're arresting anywhere about 4,000 on average people per year. Um, that's a high number. So we're clearing a lot of crime. Do I have to I don't have a question, but again, you're doing such a job, good job catching all these people. We did the papers with the crime committed, and you seem to catch them the next couple of days. So you're doing a hell of a job, and I want to. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Um, anything else? Great. Thank you. Thank you. Joyce would like to introduce a couple additional members of our audience. Yeah, there, there are actually a couple other uh, board members from the Washington Manor Homeowners Association. I forgot to mention my good friend Lydia Riccio, who's the secretary for the Washington Manor Homeowners Association. And uh, it, we also have with us the president of Washington Manor Homeowners Association, Marty Lance. Our neighborhood watch member of our homeowners association is in charge of neighborhood watch so if you live in washington manor homeowners association and you want to put a neighborhood watch group together please see amora nolan amora. Um, before we go to engineering i want to put the fire chief on the uh, uh, hot seat for a second um, thank him for coming tonight and actually i think it'd be good perhaps if you spoke just a little bit about um, what we're going to be doing in the future with disaster preparation and our, what we call our CERT classes. Um, so this is our Alameda County Fire Chief, Sheldon Gilbert. Well, good evening, it's a pleasure to be here and I wasn't expecting to speak, I truly just came to, to watch and observe, but uh, it's a pleasure to be able to say a few words to you. And I think one of the things um, I would say just real quickly before I talk about disaster preparedness is, you do have an exemplary police department. We work with a lot of police agencies and they're all dedicated and they all do a lot of good things, but there's been two incidents here in the last month where your police agency have partnered with us and helped us do our job better. And one was a fire where they rescued an 83-year-old uh, female in a wheelchair down three flights of stairs. And the other was the water rescue out in the bay where they went in and swam and, and got the people out. They did stay out of our stuff. <laughs> One of the th ways that the city's being very proactive is that they are reinstituting a program that was a, a, a victim of the budget cut several years ago, and that's participating in the fire department's emergency preparedness program. And one of the things that we're able to offer as a regional provider, meaning we provide to de several different cities and several different communities, is a very proactive emergency preparedness program. And that really comes down to a couple types of programs. And one of them is called CERT, which is Community Emergency Response Training. And it's an 18-hour course where you can get your neighborhood, and we're trying to overlay them with the neighborhood watch programs everywhere we can. And we can train you and your neighbors on what it means to be prepared as a community, to know what's going on, and to map your community so you know where the resources within your community, and you know where the needs are within your community. So that when a disaster happens, and as we've learned, other than your local resources, which you will get immediately, uh, the government may be here to help you, but it may be more than uh, 48 to 72 hours. So we need to be more self-sufficient as a community and you partnering with your public safety agencies. So this CERT training is something that you can do within your community to be better, better prepared. We will train you, we will equip you, we will help you map out your neighborhood so that you can work with the, the resources that do show up after a large-scale incident and make sure you can sustain yourself for that 72 to 96 hours. The other program that we have that's very important is a personal preparedness class, and it's a, it's a lot less um, time. It's only two to three hours, and that's something where we teach you what you need to do in your residency to make sure you have your medicines and your pets and your exit plan and your, your, your contacts out of the area and all the different things you're going to need so that when, you, when there is a disaster, you're able to sustain yourself and then be available to help your neighbors and or your family members uh, and, and be able to, to help us get back to a sense of normalcy 
as quickly as possible. So that's a couple examples. We're also going to be providing some training for staff at the city and doing some drills in the emergency operations center. The, the police chief and I will be working together on some multidisciplinary drills with city staff to make sure that we're all ready to go no matter what the emergency is so that we can provide the most amount of help in the quickest amount of time possible. So anyway, uh, I'll stop there, but I want to say thank you. We enjoy working with you guys down here in this area. You're very proactive, and uh, you are a well-prepared community, and you're very engaged in your community, so keep doing it. All right? Thanks. So say you're here in the neighborhood, and you're interested in signing up for the search training or personal preparedness. How do you find out about this? When will it be happening down the road? We'll be putting out a, a, we're working with the city right now to put together an annual calendar. So we'll be putting out an annual calendar. There's a couple ways you can do that. You can call the fire department's main number and they'll put you into the, the hotline, which you can go ahead and leave your name and what you need and, and we'll let you know in the next classes. You can go online if you have a computer um, and at acgov.org, Alameda County Fire. Uh, you can log on and you can look at our calendar and look at our classes and, and also email questions to our emergency <coughs> preparedness manager. And then I am uh, quite confident that once we get the schedule finalized, it will also be on the city's master calendar, as well as some of the newsletters and different things that come out from the city itself. So if you go online to the Alameda County Fire Department webpage, or just Google Alameda County Fire, or call our main number at 510-618-3490, someone will be put in touch with you to help you get what you need. Okay? Steve? Sir? Can you, can you tell us anything about this 30-inch uh, gas line that runs, natural gas leaking line that runs? along here, how aware yeah. of that are you are? Yeah, well, we're, we're aware of it, and we, we uh, have been working very closely with pg e and they're doing some hydrostatic testing on all of their, their main uh, distribution lines and transmission lines. That's a transmission line. A distribution line is a smaller line that takes yeah. it to the residents. A, a, a distribution line is the larger lines. Like it's the same there. kind of line to Sam Bruno? It was the same diameter. Um, it's it's a, not quite as old. It is um, it is being hydrostatically tested. Uh, we have been working with PG&E and have gotten updated maps. We know where the shutoffs are. We've done a bit of pre-fire planning on that line and, and how it goes up and down the, and near the tracks. And so we're... Uh, uh, reasonably so assured that we're ready to, to go. turn it off if you have to turn it off. Uh, we, we know where PG&E needs to turn it off if it needs to be turned off. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we are aware of it. And we're working closer with PG&E than we ever have. And hopefully the governor will be signing a bill very soon called SB44, which was sponsored um, by um, this point, uh, Senator Corbett. And Senator Corbett from our area sponsored that, which may stem uh, have uh, GIS maps and a, and, a, and a response plan with the local fire department, and we are going to be the pilot for that program. Oh, so, so Senator Corbett's taking care of us on that part. How old is that line? Do you know? I don't. It's I can get that. Years old. I, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's over. It's over to 40 or 50 years old. Yeah. 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 Thank you very much, Chief. Um, and it's now it's my pleasure to introduce Keith Cook and Ken Joseph from our traffic and engineering department. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Keith Cook. I'm the principal engineer uh, with the city of San Leandro. And uh, with me today is Ken Joseph, who's our city engineer. And um, I want to thank uh, the council members for allowing us to share with you some of the things that are going on here in the city with relationship to uh, engineering and public works uh, type projects. Um, and I'll work from over on this side. We'll do it as a team. Ken and I will we'll do this as a team. Um, so we're going to cover uh, these topics and um, hopefully uh, get you uh, up and aware of about all the things that, that are going on. The first thing I'm going to talk about is a, a recently finished project. We finished, uh, I guess, in June 2010. Is the uh, Washington Beatrice and Washington um, Fargo um, intersection, and there, there have been some questions about that. And so um, we wanted to uh, take a second and talk about that, and then we'll, we'll get to these other ones you can kind of see. So we'll go ahead. So um, one of the big things on on, at, on this project was the addition of uh, of turn lanes at various locations, and then we also changed some signal operations at the the Fargo Avenue uh, interchange, and then also. Um, uh, spread out the traffic a little bit at the Washington Beatrice um, intersection. So we'll go to the next one. Um, this is kind of a view of the uh, Washington Beatrice. Um, you can see we um, we uh, separated a, uh, pull up my, 
We uh, separated the traffic that proceeded uh, that's uh, southbound on Washington so that it would be able to merge a little bit further onto the freeway uh, here. Um, this project was funded, I must say it was funded by our Measure B funds. So uh, uh, a large portion of the project was funded by our Actia Measure B funds, which are our half, our half cent sales tax. And uh, also, um, so we separated this and um, allowed for a little bit better merging and hopefully it didn't, it didn't uh, um, uh, shorten the time through here, but I think it made it a little bit clear, clearer. And we also added a, a left turn lane um, an additional left turn lane, and that actually made a big difference uh, safety-wise, so we'll get to that. We're still waiting for um, Caltrans to do their portion of the work, uh, which is the off-ramp off -ramp portion. Uh, another big change was here on uh, Washington and Fargo. Uh, we added lanes, uh, a, uh, a dedicated left turn lane here, uh, an additional left turn lane here, and those were the, the two major changes. And this allowed us to change the function of the, um, the traffic signal. It used to be a split phase function, and we were able to change it to an eight phase function, what we call, so that you'll basically, uh, these left turns occur, this left turn and this, these left turns can occur at the same time. And what that allows you to do is to get a little more throughput through the intersection. So um, we'll go on to the next stage. So you can see um, at, uh, Washington Fargo, we had a large delay, and so allowing that uh, split, say, split phase, uh, get rid of, getting rid of the split phase serves, no, can't get to say that fast three times. Uh, the split phase service allowed us to improve the operations at that intersection. At Washington Beatrice, um, there wasn't that much change. This is probably more of an anomaly in terms of, of time difference at that intersection. But what we did see is that we reduced the, the collisions there by two-thirds. A lot of those collisions used to occur in that single left turn from northbound Washington onto Beatrice, and people would stop in that lane, and they would not be out of the travel lane. And so we had a lot of, uh, of uh, rear-end collisions at that location. So um, that's what uh, occurred uh, at Washington Beatrice. So we'll go on to the next uh, one of the, an upcoming project we have is here. This is at the Washington, Monterey, and Bradrick intersection. Do you recognize it now? Yeah. Uh, right now, it, 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 there is a, um, a left turn pocket, but the, as you can tell, there's no left turn signal there. And so it's, it's a problematic uh, location for us in terms of uh, collisions. So it, we know this, is, this intersection has a lot of history as well. So, um, but. Um, we um, we uh, uh, participated in a, a grant program where we were fortunate enough to receive funds to be able to um, upgrade this uh, intersection. And so if you go to the next slide, um, what we're going to be doing is um, we'll be uh, <coughs> able to install a left turn signal on the Washington Avenue approaches. Now that does require somewhat of a change. This is been here since the 1960s when that was before um, Halcyon continued all the way on to Floresta and we think the um, the traffic pattern has changed a little bit but um, and so it, we're going to remove this prohibition on left turns but we're also going to signalize the left turns from Washington onto Monterey and Bradrick and we're hoping that reduces the collisions that occur at that location now on the Bradrick uh, side, as you can tell, um, visibility of the signals is rather difficult. You would have to look just about right over here. There's a signal here, and then there's a little one over here. So this will get a full um, blown signal. We'll also probably trim that uh, bush as well, and from both directions, so that um, you'll have a better um, a view of the signals as you approach the intersection. Hopefully that will make that safer as well. All right. So, uh, as uh, Council Member um, Sorosiak mentioned uh, and uh, uh, talked about, is the uh, Kaiser Hospital development. And this is just the um, uh, opportunity for us to let you know that you know construction is getting ready to start, and uh, there's no easy way to get around construction. But we, we're just going to have to grin and bear it. And we, and and Kaiser's been doing a good job of trying to. Uh, make sure things go smoothly on all their initial um, 
construction. I'm just showing you this. I'm, I don't really mean for you to try to read every detail, but I'm just letting you know when the first the first major bit of construction you're going to see, um, the lanes are going to get pushed to the west. And in general, there's going to be a one lane on Merced uh, going southbound uh, throughout all the construction and uh, two lanes going northbound on Merced during the construction. And this construction will start in earnest near the end of this summer, around September. So um, think about that as you plan your, uh, your travels and uh, you know, adjust accordingly. Eventually, when this is all done, we'll have uh, plenty of lanes through here. But I mean, there's just going to be more activity at this location, and, and it's just uh, the part of growth. And so um, it'll probably work better going northbound, so probably use it northbound. Southbound, consider other alternatives. <laughs> Oh yeah, we're widening. The street is, gets widened all through here. As you can see, uh, uh, most of the widening. This is a. This is the Kaiser property right here. Most of the widening occurs right here. There's a little bit of widening that occurs along this last property on Merced, just just south of Fairway Drive, uh, and then uh, we do a little widening on Fairway Drive over on that, there's like an AT&T, used to be 84 Lumber uh, property, we do a little widening over there as well. So, what about on the uh, west side of Merced? There's, there's a little bit of widening um, that occurs right around in here. Um, not much, you, you can kind of make it out. There's a little sliver right here, and there's a little sliver right here that gets, gets wide. What's the time range? It starts in September, and uh, this first phase will probably get done um, from September to November, December. There'll be a little break during the uh, rainy season, and then uh, the following summer, uh, early spring, we'll do the, the Kaiser development, we'll do that portion. Is there any chance you will fix the light? And oh, all of the all of the uh, intersections get uh, new traffic signals. Because right now the, the, the light when you're going north on Merced, it, it fairway, it automatically turns on the left turn lane and there's nobody there. Oh well, that's good to know. Do you have a time? Does that when do you see that occurring? At yeah, 24/7. Okay, well I'll uh, we'll have our um, our public services crew and my our traffic operations engineer check the operation there. I don't and, think uh, there's a sensor in the ground. Well, sometimes the, the detectors do go bad, and, and that could be just the case. And so um, we'll, we'll check that out. But uh, thank you very much. What's the hot plan coming up the freeway going to get over to Reset? Say it again. To get into Kaiser. You turn off the freeway 880. Yes. Uh, in fact, right you know what? When I go to this next slide, we'll, 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 we'll see that. Why don't we go on to the next slide? May I ask how long that's going to be one lane going south? It'll be about a year. Yes. <laughs> We're also going to, there will also be some additional um, uh, construction going on, not by us, but also by Caltrans on I-80. We're going to be constructing uh, a new HOV lane from basically Hagenberger, which is right here, uh, south to um, just past Marina Boulevard where the uh, HOV lane starts now. So there will be a continuous HOV lane from, from uh, Hagerberger all the way down. Um, how that impacts uh, San Leandro is that uh, the interchange is at Davis Street and uh, Marina uh, get uh, reconstructed. They're quite old and they've been hit a number of times and so um, <laughs> Uh, they're going to get uh, upgraded. So, but we do have to go through the construction of them being upgraded. But when they're done, uh, we'll have wider bridges. Uh, we'll be able to accommodate a little bit more traffic uh, on those areas, and I, I think the operation of the interchanges will be much better afterwards. And, and we'll uh, take a look at the marina. And uh, oh, unfortunately, I thought this uh, marine. Well, it does. So yes, um, the. For going to Kaiser, you will. This is a 880 going southbound this way, 
Um, so you can exit, uh, you'll be exiting off you know, pretty close, although this will be signalized to where it is now. The bulk of the turns will go to Merced if you're coming from the freeway. Uh, we're working with Caltrans on the potential for um, city traffic to be able to use Marina and enter into um, the Kaiser site just um, east of the Denny's. This is Denny's right here and enter the site and going down a parallel roadway here. Um, that's not uh, a done deal yet. It's it's a we have to work with Caltrans on on that. So that's how we're going to be handling the traffic into the um, the Kaiser facility. So um, it's yeah. important. You might want to mention how ambulances are going to get there. Well, ambulances um, will approach um, in. There's two directions. There's this direction, obviously, but if the ambulance uh, knows the area well. A lot of them will use um, Tea Garden and um, proceed into down Tea Garden to um, Fairway. Fairway and over the uh, in, over the uh, the freeway and enter into the back side of the site where the uh, the emergency area is kind of uh, uh, really off of Fairway um, for the uh, the Kaiser facility. We're not trying to shut down both of those overpasses at the same time. Well, there, the, there may be, there will never be both interchange shut down at the same time. Now, there will be construction going on in each of the interchanges, but there will always maintain two lanes of traffic in each direction uh, during the, well, during most travel times. There will be some evening hours where they will have to do some uh, detours and, and shutdowns, but during most travel times, for most, in fact, for all commute hours, there will always be two lanes of travel in both directions over both the Davis and Marina uh, Boulevard. Um, and that's what it starts. Uh, the construction starts September 2012. Probably will be a little bit later when it really gets going in earnest. So next year. And I think I'm going to turn this over to uh, Ken Joseph. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm just going to speak a little bit about the uh, roadway construction uh, that we're going to be doing this this year. The re the repaving in the uh, yeah in, in districts three and four. Uh, you know what you know what would it be? Uh, it wouldn't be a summertime if we weren't tearing up the street someplace. That's what my wife always tells me. <laughs> yeah. uh, so anyway, we have three different kinds of projects that we're going to be doing this year. This first one. Uh, is actually a federal grant. It's, it's to rebuild portions of Marina Boulevard. Uh, actually, two sections. Uh, one actually here to the uh, uh, to the east of San Diego Boulevard, but, but specifically within uh, District 3, the area between Alvarado and Key Garden. Uh, it's about a two-month pro uh, project. Uh, we expect it to start in, in the middle of August. Uh, but because of the traffic there, it will be a nighttime, it will be a nighttime project. It's not a full reconstruction. What we're going to do is remove about four inches of asphalt, uh, uh, fix some other uh, uh, bad pavement in, in small areas, and then repave the, the entire section of the street. Uh, and again, like I said, this we're fortunate enough to receive federal money uh, for this. And federal grants typically are granted for streets that are on the federal network, where those are basically arterial streets, large streets that handle uh, a lot of traffic. Uh, the second one is uh, its actually part of our annual uh, street ceiling project. Uh, this is done in conjunction with the uh, Public Works uh, Department. They do, uh, uh, they have the uh, city broken up into various uh, maintenance areas and we, along with Public Works, focus on certain areas uh, each year. Uh, this year, it's really uh, a, a good portion of, of uh, District 3 and part of District 6. Uh, that, that we're focusing on. And we're doing something, actually I would say new, but it's new, this is for the second year. We're using a lot of um, different types of methods of, of sealing, which actually helps restore streets that we couldn't seal before. Um, we, we use a combination of ground up um, rubber from tires. Uh, so it's a green product, but it also has um, better capability of bringing a street back that in years past, we would have had to remove the asphalt and do 
a lot, a lot more work, a lot more expensive work. So with this, we get the work done quicker, and it's also a lot cheaper. We do a lot more streets. Uh, so, so this year in District Three, the streets specific in District Three are in a good portion of Castro Street, uh, and then a portion of Alvarado, and, and then a portion of Montague. Um, it is a, it is almost a two-month uh, project, but each one of these streets. You know, it takes less than you know, less than a couple of days to actually uh, to actually do the work, so the work goes by very quickly. And then, uh, last but not least, as, as part of the annual uh, reconstruction uh, project, uh, we're doing one street in district in District Four. This is and this is a uh, uh, Andover between Lowelling and Burkhart. Uh, currently, this uh, this street um, uh, there's been a lot of press the last little month or so talking about the. Uh, the PCI rating, which is basically a report card of streets. Um, uh, 100 is a new street, zero is dirt. Um, Andover uh, is is currently rated at eight, so uh, it's probably a little past due. So anyway, so we'll, we'll be coming through. It will be that street. Anybody here live on in, in that portion of Andover? Um, uh, we will. Again, we've been using new processes for, uh, the last few years, uh, where we rather than do a, a lot of asphalt, which is very expensive, and, it, and um, we use a combination of, of uh, cement treatment, which will actually put cement down and um, and blend it into the to the dirt, and actually strengthen the underlying soil and pave over the top of it. It's very successful. We've done a, we've done a number of streets. Um, so we'll be doing we'll be doing that. Like I said, we expect doing that in September. And um, yes, it will be on that. So we'll try to get out of your way as quickly as we can. Question here. Uh, our transportation feel about the street and all is that still under evaluation? Now that it was the first couple of days, is it worthwhile? Continue. The I'm going to help. We still there's still there's a traffic calming program that you know, process to go through, but you know speed humps are are added um, after a process uh, if a street is qualified and it's requested by a sufficient number of the other neighbors of a particular area. Uh, this this project uh, is is adding speed humps, I believe. Um, I'm trying to remember the area. It's in the northern end of town, but I can't. I don't recall. Victoria. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Is street? Speed bumps still going on, or they're still being evaluated there, there, for the objective for what they were put in for? Is your question: Are they are we evaluate? We evaluate speed yeah, after the speed after the speed bumps have been put in? Are we going to add any more? We yes, we're actually we're adding we're adding some we're adding some this, this year. Yeah. We still use it. Worst thing in the world you can do. Let's talk to my insurance man. <laughs> I'm not sure exactly what I'm hearing because I don't hear too well. But I understand you do an annual pavement of some of the streets every year. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. How do you go about selecting which streets you pick? Carol? I mean, I know you've got, I mean, how often, how many streets do you use? Well, it's 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 based it's based on the funding level that we have for any, any one particular year. Uh -huh. We have every every other year. In fact, this is this is this is this is a year that we that, that is taking place actually this summer. An inspection of all the pavement in, in the city you did, is you done. Inspected everything throughout the whole city. We, we we inspect the, the entire so thing. You, you already have places marked out that do need to be repaved at some point in time. Oh, absolutely. We, every every every, every street there's there's over a thousand street segments that yes. we've divided the streets up in town. Right. We give each one a grade from from 100, like say, which is a brand new street, right. down to down to down to zero, which is yeah, I've effectively over number, number eight and number nine. Right. So, so. I'm kind of wondering how you go about picking them out. Right. And then, and then what we do is is that we we take we apply the money that we have <laughs> to street segments that are both in poor condition and receive a lot of traffic because right. I mean, the traffic is something we're trying to. You know, uh, influence the, the most drivers. You know, because you might you might have a street that has a very low number, low low grade, uh -huh. but if it doesn't receive a lot of traffic, it might be skipped over for one that might 
be slightly <coughs> better, but at least receives a lot more traffic. But it still be quite, but you see there are other people who have to drive over those and they may not be part of the normal, you know, I mean, I travel between here and Alameda quite a bit on Doodle Drive, and parts of Doodle Drive are pumped, but there's a section there, if you turn around and drive over it, I mean, you better have a truck, because <laughs> it's just, you know, just a mess. I mean, not very long, but, it's just, but I'm trying to say, I know this is not true of just Doodle Drive. It's true of a lot of places in the family, where you have these short little strips that have or, or parts of areas that have not because there's not that much traffic because you're dealing with and how do they ever get fixed up? That's what I want. I mean, when do they get fixed up? Eventually. I mean, I mean, eventually, you know, we, we, we do have to, we do have to, even the, even the streets that receive, you know, I mean, if, I, it's easy for me to say that I'm going to deal with the streets that have, you know, the most traffic, worst, you know, right. bad condition and the worst traffic. But obviously, if you if you live on the street on the short segment, and you might be the only car driving on town, uh -huh. that's still that's still your street. So right. we, we have we do have we do have to get to it, and we also work with Public Works with uh -huh. with the, in their pavement program. Uh -huh. They will do work. I don't know if you've um, if, if you've been in the area in in in, um, in District Three. Um, and actually, other places in town, you'll see what they've been doing: crack sealing. They've been working very hard to prepare streets and to get to keep streets in the best condition that they can. Sort of right. 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 Well, I've seen some of that. Right. But it's, 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 yeah. okay. I'll, well, thank you. I'll address this briefly during my comments about the budget. Okay. Well, thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, the first picture about Broadway and Washington, and. Uh, I think uh, it doesn't reflect the actual situation. Or you have there, going on farm, or you have two left turn only lanes. And one lane to the right to right turn and go straight across. What happened during the school uh, session, in the morning and in the afternoon when the parents come back on that street, they, most of them turn right. And the problem there that right lane becomes three, four blocks long, while there's nobody on the left turn, or one or two vehicles on the left turn, we have two lanes for left turn only. They used to be, I saw the picture, I think that doesn't reflect the real situation. Before, they used to be, the middle lane used to come straight and left. Now they, they change it later to only left. So uh, that, that's a problem that during the school session mostly. And sometimes even when the freeway is crossed for whatever reason, we have five, six blocks long le uh, line of cars there waiting. And uh, not only on Fargo, but around the other street that comes around on Wemson. I, you know, you're absolutely right. Um, there's just not enough room to handle all the traffic. And unfortunately, you know. One left, one straight, one right. That's all it should be. Well, with the two left turn lane, somebody is, is stuck turning, right. getting onto the freeway. They, they need to have that middle lane go straight. That's yeah. right. Right now, right now, the the signal operates. Used to be the signal operate in separate phases. So we would service only the uh, what was that uh, eastbound Fargo, only by itself. And so you could have all those movements occur um, from that from that from those lanes. And then the same thing from the greenhouse marketplace. Uh, they had. They had to go. They had its own movement, so you could do all the movements at one time. So when you try to operate the the signal more efficiently, you have to separate the movements. So we had to pick a particular time that we were going to try to satisfy. You, we usually you either do uh, the peak uh, uh, traffic periods, where, which are either in the morning or at five o'clock at night. And so for for that area, the peak one actually is in the morning. And so the left lanes were, were given the double left turn lanes. Unfortunately, we can't shift the lanes you know, throughout the day. I wish we had that kind of technology. We just, we don't have that available to us. 
we would have to get rid of the gas station if we needed a, to have another lane. So, so, <laughs> but somebody has works and jobs there, so there's just not enough space to accommodate all of the traffic at that intersection. That when you turn left, there is nothing else moving anyway. So any anybody the same way that you can go straight on the right lane, you can go straight on the middle lane. Well, then we would have to change the operation back to what it was before, because you can't allow a left turn and a through to occur simultaneously with a left turn from Fargo, because the through lane will run into the people making a left. So. I made two blocks from there. I said, uh, with, with reference to the turn at Beatrice or Freeway, yes. those left turn lanes yes. are confusing to people who don't know that they're there. They look helpful people know, but nobody wants to go. You're absolutely right. And, and we're, we're looking at trying to improve that signage there. It's, it's a difficult situation. Hopefully, you know, a lot of the drivers are commuters, and so they eventually learn where to go. And so we count on a little bit of that, but we could, you know, probably do some additional signage. Go ahead. Uh, do you have any knowledge of Caltrans has a plan to rebuild the Washington overpass? Length of the lanes that go eastbound and southbound, particularly I ask this question because we still have all the trucks that go eastbound and go through that two-lane access to 238. And you know that that will ever be corrected by increasing the lanes. Well, you're right. It, it's on their list, but that's like a like a almost a hundred million dollar project. So. Um, I believe I paid that in taxes. <laughs> <laughs> Since we went up to 10% or something. Yeah. <laughs> Fortunately, we're going down. Yeah. But, <laughs> but um, so I'm not sure when it's going to happen. I couldn't. If, if I could predict when those things were going to happen, I'd probably be in a different business. Yeah. yeah. The problem with that particular uh, uh, roadway is that when you're leaving the manor and you're going to go eastbound on 238, you have a very short distance and you've got to dodge trucks to get onto that. <laughs> it's a difficult to interchange, yeah? That, 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 that interchange would, wouldn't exist if they tried to build the thing today. I mean, that, that, is, that was built, I want to say, in the early 50s. 50s. Yeah. And, you know, it, it's something, you know, the, the, things that, the things that you, that you would do today um, I mean, you're. They wouldn't allow. Look, look, look what they did with the 680-24 interchange and what what happened there, and you know, over the hill. Um, you know, that's 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 the magnitude of project you're looking at to try to separate two free. You have, you have two freeways you have to separate plus a local on ramp, and it's you know, it's a geometric. Uh, uh, it's going to be a big project. Just, they will. It'd probably be a lot of separations. And the, the you know they'll separate all the different uh, traffic. It, it's just going to be a big project. Um, I just couldn't tell you. It's, I know they have it on the drawing boards. I know they they know it's a challenge. I just couldn't tell you when it's going to um, get built. The one partial solution is to allow trucks on 580. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> Uh, don't you have a full body full of yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why is San Leandro Boulevard, when you're coming to Davis, the number one lane closest to the center, all of a sudden become a left-hand turn lane, and there's no warning about it? There's yeah, no warning. street sign, there's no trending in the lane, it just, all oh, there you are in the left-hand turn lane now. <laughs> That's your Davis. If, if I did, uh, if you can hold that thought for about a year. <laughs> I, we are currently in the process, selling a Boulevard between Davis and William. Williams yeah. will look different than it does. Yeah. So. But just a sign which would warn us that this lane is going to become a left-hand turn lane. That I could do overnight. <laughs> that would be a 
I got to jump over. Yeah, no, we we could definitely take a look at, uh, you know, signing that lane there. Yes. I can't believe somebody got faked it. The design can't help. Yeah, back in 1970 yeah. or so. No, who painted the lines? <laughs> <laughs> Well, we'll check when school starts back up. We'll we'll do a check around two thirty. No, it's uh, in the morning. In the morning. Morning. Well, we our counts are during the morning. I mean, we, it's about it's about thirty minutes of pure health. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's all gone. I mean, it's a short burst. Uh, Ken, how much money would it take to fix all of our roads? I mean, it, it is it is a, it is a big it is a big numbers game. I mean, you know, yeah. you're you're at like sixty million or something like that. Is that enough? Is that enough? No. I mean, the chances of us getting that kind of money are ridiculous, but. If we would split spin in some of this money and um, bailing out banks and bailing out other people and put everybody to work fix the roads, we might have everybody back in work again, right? Because all the roads and all the cities have the same problem, you know? Do, do we have any, how about one final question? Do we have a final question related to traffic or our roads? Oh, okay. okay. It's not really about the traffic or roads, but I just want to know who's responsible. I think it's in this group, but I'm not sure. Who's responsible for the bus stop uh, buses? Where you know the sidewalk and the seats and the you know when you want to catch your bus and you want to sit down and wait. The bus stops. For the bus stops. Yeah. The, the equipment and the furnishings there. Well, yes, and not only that, but keeping them clean. Who's um, responsible? I'll, I mean, I'm going to write a little letter. Yeah. Yeah. Is it the one with the advertising? Yeah. Shelter? That's a private company, but you can. Uh, but who, who takes? Who keeps care of the streets and the, and the plants around it? And you know, if they've got a, a tree on it that's dropping fruit all over the place and that kind of stuff. That would be the property owner's tree, whoever owns the but tree. But well, uh, how, oh. how about we talk after? I'm sorry, yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's why I asked if they knew. Okay. So I, I missed a little bit about the roads, but we we do have a street that's that been patched several times and has great big holes and right. and. Um, one of the large holes is right in front of my house. <laughs> and so, who, how do we, I, I, I know the budget thing. And why, why don't you talk about your specific road to Ken or Keith okay. after, after, okay? Um, and, um, let's see here. I actually, Kathy spoke briefly. This is Kathy Ornelas, who's our community relations representative. And, I'm just here for four years, and Kathy is the real strength in the mayor's <laughs> office. So, um, her phone number is uh, on the, uh, my phone number too, but her phone number is here on the agenda. Um, you know, if you have a question, you know, it's almost anything under the sun about an ordinance, about a neighborhood issue. Kathy is a fantastic resource. I mean, and it's amazing of uh, questions that we get. Um, and um, so feel free to contact Kathy. Um, and also, um, 
please make sure when you leave tonight that you pick up one of the red cards. It has key phone numbers, including Kathy's phone number on it. We also have a sheet here. It's, it's kind of like a questionnaire. Um, feel free to take this and fill it out. If, you know, if there's particular issues that you want to mention to us that we didn't cover tonight, obviously tonight focuses very much on crime and public safety and traffic and roads. But if there's other concerns I'm sure you might have, feel free to uh, fill us out and give it to Kathy or myself after the meeting and we'll get back to you um, on it. Um, I want to talk briefly about the uh, city budget for a second and it does relate to our roads. Um, it's, it's a good news, bad news situation. The good news is that our budget is balanced for next fiscal year, which starts on July 1st of 2011 and goes to June 30th of 2012. Uh, the city was running a deficit, operating deficit for about four years and relied upon reserves to cover the deficit. Um, but for this upcoming year, we're in the black. We're in the black in part because of the passage of Measure uh, Z, which is the sales tax increase. Um, and also some hard work done by city staff to look at the budget and come up with additional savings. Um, now, we're not hugely in the black. It's only about a $300,000 surplus um, that we're projecting that will be put in to start to rebuild our reserves. And it's, it is, though, a conservative budget in the sense that um, a large portion of the city's revenue comes from the sales tax a smaller portion comes from property tax. We are projecting a zero increase in sales tax revenue for our next fiscal year above what we're going to get from the additional money for Measure Z. We're projecting no growth whatsoever in our property tax revenue. So if the economy does come back a bit, you know, if we see like a one or 2% uh, growth in our sales tax, we're going to have greater um, funds coming into the city We'll be putting that into building up our reserves. And that's really important because, so that's the good news. Now, the, the bad news is that even though we're in the black for next year, we're not rebuilding any of the programs that have been cut over the years. We're not refilling some of the jobs that have been lost. Uh, the city staff is down by about 20% from the, uh, its height a few years ago to what it is today. Um, and as we move forward, Though the budget, we're doing a very, we've done a very comprehensive five year forecast, and it shows that we start to get into the red the following year by about 125,000, then the next year by about 800,000, the following year by over a million. So, you know, we have a time period where we can look at our budget and, we, um, and we're stable for again the 11 12 year, but we really have to make some hard decisions next year. We have a structural deficit that we have to address. Um, and you know, part of that is going to be conversations with our employees. Part of it is going to be trying to bring in new business to town to generate additional revenue, um, spending our money wisely. That's the challenge that we as the council members uh, uh, have in, in communication with you and what your priorities are. Because you know, ultimately, a budget reflects the values and priorities of the community. We want to maintain our police force. We want to have excellent fire service. We want to have programs that you know create a vibrancy to San Leandro, like our library, our, our recreation parks department. Um, and so there's some, there, but we also at the end of the day have to have a balanced budget. And we don't have the reserves that we used to have. Uh, reserves are very small compared to the past, um, so there's not much margin of error anymore. Um, you know, on this topic of the roads. Um, you saw that you know certain work is being done, and each year the city um, is, puts in. Uh, well, actually, currently it's about two million dollars a year from Measure B and federal money. Is it, okay. okay. So we and this is money that's separate from like just fixing a pothole on your street. I'm talking about capital improvements where there's fundamental work done to a roadway to bring it much up, the whole roadway up to a much higher condition. We're spending about $2 million a year currently. That money that we're spending is coming from what's called Measure B, which is an Alameda County tax measure, which all the cities get, and some of it's coming from the federal government. We are not spending any money currently out of the city's general fund on major road work. And that is a core governmental function. All cities should spend money out of their general fund on improving the roads. Because of the budget crisis, we're not doing that right now. 
And that's also one of the discussions that we have to have going for the future. For us to keep our roads in their current condition, which is a very low condition, as we all know, we should be spending seven, eight? Uh, six and a half million dollars. Okay, so we're spending two right now, and we should be spending about six and a half just to keep them in the not so good condition. And obviously more to try to get the condition up to a much higher level. You know, and this is a real challenge, because um, how are we gonna find the money? Um, and I just want to alert you to it, that this is, so you know, even though we have a balanced budget, I'm very happy of that. I don't believe we have a sustainable budget that truly meets the needs of our community over the long run. And you know, we just have to have some honest and frank conversations. Um, there's no effort right now by the council to return to the public with a tax measure for 2012. I want to assure you, there was an article in the paper about our roads. There is no conversation about how are we going to address this over the long haul. Um, but in the short term, it's not going to be through a revenue measure. Uh, in the long term, though, I think we're going to have to have that conversation with the community. And in, in terms of conversations, you know, I want this to be an annual event. Um, and you know, and, and thanks for the feedback, you know, particularly on some of you know the, all the different topics. And you know, it's great for us to hear. It's great for staff to hear that. Um, and I want to introduce. Councilmember Souza now, who hasn't had a chance to talk to you, and she wants to talk about a few issues. Thank you, Mayor. Welcome, everyone, tonight. And I'm just going to check the mayor's notes real quick. I think that we have a commissioner in the audience, Lee Thomas, who wasn't acknowledged. He's my Board of Zoning Commissioner. And also, he's a former president of the Russian Homeowners Association, which is represent. Are there any Floresta Homeowners Association? People here tonight? No? Okay. So I encourage you again to join your homeowner association. It's not for homeowners only, it's for residents. And I also would like to introduce the two leaders of our crime free San Leandro. Citizens, Citizens for Safer, Safer, San, Safer San, San Leandro. Stand up. Turn around and make, a, make sure everyone knows who you are. Yes. Because these are people you can contact to get your neighborhoods. In addition to our neighborhood watch for Washington Manor, these are contacts for you to utilize to make your neighborhood safer. We all want our neighborhoods to be safer. So I encourage you to take advantage of the opportunities that we have in front of us. And next I'd like to just touch a little bit on some citywide things that are going on. We've talked about some district things. So I'm just going to touch a little bit on some citywide things. A couple things I want to point out to you. One thing, our Marina Park Course. How many of you walked the Marina Park Course? That's going to be repaved. So it's going to be closed down, I believe, in October. Right after the dog park's done, they're going to build the Marina Park Course. So you have to walk out towards the, the water instead of the park course for a couple of months, October to December, or something like that. So that when you see it closed, it's just because we're repaving the trail out there to make it a better trail and it's going to be less of a grade. I, believe, I think we're going to regrade it and do a lot of great things out there. Yeah. So just watch out for that. They already touched on the overpasses that are going to be under construction down the road and that's going to impact everyone in San Leandro. And, um, so we're going to be asking you for a lot of patience with a lot of construct road construction that's going on in the city. And as um, they used to tell us in our meetings, it's like you can't have that great bathroom unless you go through remodel. So just remember, you have to have the remodel to get the great you know, improvements. So just think of that as you're stuck in traffic and hopping, hoping to get somewhere. Because they will come. The other thing I wanted to touch on real quick is, this is, first of all, I just want to applaud you all for coming tonight because I know it's time out of your day. And, we, I as a council member, greatly appreciate when residents show up at meetings like this and at our council meetings. Meetings like this are your opportunity to have a real question and answer period with your council members. Whereas when you go to a council meeting or a committee meeting, because there are several committees that the council members all sit on, there is an option for public comment, but it's not a question and answer period. We're there to listen to what you say, and that's because of the Brown Act. We can't talk about things in a meeting and take action unless it's on the agenda. So when you come for public comment and have random comments, we can hear them, but we can't enter into a conversation with you regarding the 
that situation. So I just want to remind you of this is the opportunity for you to have that question and answer period and you know really really ask us the hard questions if you have them. But when you get to, I encourage you to come to city council meetings and our committee meetings because it's great for us to hear your comments. But just be aware that it's not a question and answer. We're just going to listen to you. So I don't want you to get discouraged and think that we're not listening, but we just can't interact with you at that point. The final thing that I want to talk about, and I'm just going to talk about this on a very high level, and I'm not asking you for input on it right now. It's just something I want you to think about because it's going to be something that's going to be discussed with the city council and decide where we're going to go. So I just want to remind you, I'm just kind of going to give you um, a high level overview of some facts. I'm not here to direct you in any way. I'm here to let you know what we're going to be talking about in the future coming up soon and ask you to think about it and contact your council members later and have a conversation with them. The other way to have a uh, question and answer paired with a council member is to call them on the phone or ask them, you know, send them an email. There you can have an exchange of conversation. So I encourage you to do that. The thing that I'm going to talk to you about is medical marijuana dispensaries and grow, grow facilities. How many of you know what those are? Great. Okay. So we're, 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 getting, we're moving along. So the council directed staff at the end of last year, I believe it was, to put together an ordinance. Well, first of all, we put a moratorium on medical marijuana in the city. And we then directed staff to say, create an ordinance to prohibit dispensaries and grow farms. So staff diligently did the work that we asked them to. When they brought that ordinance back to us, the ordinance was rejected by council. So now we still have a moratorium, and it's going to expire, but we'll probably extend it for another year. But we're going to be we're going to be needing to give staff direction on what we want them to create. They have no direction right now. And we haven't given them any. So I just want you as residents to be aware that coming down the road, we're, we're going to be giving them direction. So if you want to have a conversation with your council member, or if you want to have input on how the council should provide that direction, I encourage you to contact your council members. And again, I I'm not, don't really want to get into a debate about anything else about the situation right now. But I do want to just encourage, make you aware of that's coming up. And if you have an opinion, share it with your council members coming up. Now I think we're going to open the floor to questions about some of the topics we talked about and topics that we didn't talk about because I'm sure there's topics out there that you, you want an answer to and now's your time to get that. So feel free to ask any of us a question and we'll do our best to help you get an answer for that. And I, I do want to be cognizant that you've been here for quite a while. We're going to stop at 8.30, but if, if folks don't have a question that hasn't been asked, we'll, we'll wait around and answer it, too. Uh, Bob, I'm going to start with you. Steve, I would be remiss if I didn't bring up the subject of the Washington Manor Pool. Is there any hope or federal money that can be used for any kind of a grant? So if, it was, if it was a takeaway, and of course it isn't going to be built in the near future, but the plumbing is in, and the promises were made that we get it. So yeah. I bring this subject up and see if there's, if there's anything down the road that could possibly help us build it. And, and thank you for raising it. Um, I'm not aware of any possible federal grant or state grant for this. Um, it's you know at some point we're going to have to have a conversation as a community about our infrastructure needs, and I think at that. Point, you know, we need to talk about the Washington Manor Pool as well. Um, it's it's not it's not possible within our general fund presently. Just a few months ago, we had a special meeting on Manor Pool. Uh, 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 and the it wasn't necessarily a special council meeting, but yes, like I did indicate, it was on our agenda. And at that time, we provided staff with direction. And then when that those ordinance came back and council re reviewed the ordinance, then 
that's that's what I said. It was rejected. But now we have to decide again what we're going to do. So we're asking you to continue to follow. Well, the, do what we did. Say what we said before. Yes. Yes. Why? Don't ever stop saying what you want to say. <laughs> Why would you make us repeat? Didn't you get it the first time? <laughs> Like I said, I, that's that's not really what I want the topic of the evening to be. I just wanted to throw that in at the end so you have time to think about it and be aware of it. Okay, I thank you for your comments. And again, I'm going to continue to encourage. And that's the, that's the process about um, city government and ordinances. And there's many opportunities that it comes before council. So you have to continue to speak and continue to share. I encourage you to do that. Thank you. This got me totally lost here. It lost me 100%. I am in District 4. Right here. This is District 4. Yes, so it is. You're not in District 4. I'm standing in District 4 right now. You have nothing, you're standing in District 4, but you have nothing to do with District 4 because you are in District 3. But I'm elected by the entire city, so I represent no, all the residents of San Leandro. That's not the 